All right, welcome back. So today we're going to continue talking about objects and inheritance, which is what we um, sort of arrived at last time. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, more about the relationship that we can achieve um, when we when objects inherit from other objects and some of the consequences of this. Um, the, the fancy, you know, ten character word. Um, the 10 characters? 11, I think. 11 or 12. Character word that we're going to talk about today is called polymorphism. Um, and this is an important feature of how Java's object model works. Um, it sounds maybe a little bit scary. It's not scary. Um, it's actually fairly intuitive. Um, but it's, a, it's an interesting uh, sort of consequence of how Java arranges objects into this type of hierarchy. Um, and it has important implications for how we program with Java objects as we model, uh, find out ways to model new kinds of data. Okay, so one thing I just want to, I'm, maybe I'm the only, I'm probably not the only professor on campus who has this problem, but um, please don't barge into the classroom early. Um, there is a class in here before us on Mondays and Wednesdays. On Fridays, you guys can show up whenever you like. I don't think they t typically meet on Fridays. But please, you know, it's, it, as, a, as a professor, it's, it's pretty disconcerting to be trying to finish up your lecture and have, like, doors opening and stuff like that. I mean, you can, you can hear that. Right? I can hear the people in the back whispering, particularly from back there. Um, I can hear people that come in and out of the room and stuff like that. So it's just a little distracting for anybody. Um, so, so please be polite to the, to the, to the person who lectures before me um, and, and don't enter the room until you are certain that they're done or, you know, it's 9.50 and there's other students in here. So, so just, you know, again, I'm, I'm sure that they would uh, provide the same consideration to us. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about what we're going to do for the next week. So... I realized as I was putting together this lecture um, that we're actually a little ahead of where I want to be. Um, and that's um, okay. That gives us a little chance to, to slow down on Friday and talk about some new stuff. I don't want to get ahead. Uh, we're moving plenty fast enough, so I certainly don't want to, to get ahead of where, where I'd like to be. Um, so, so here's what we're going to do. Um, so today, we're going to talk about some new stuff. And we'll, we'll get a little bit of a chance to practice with inheritance, which I, I just threw at you um, on Monday. On Friday, we're going to sort of stop and essentially just do a pure sort of object review session. Um, if there's things I need to talk about that we don't get to today, those will be covered on Friday when we get started. But mainly what I'm going to do on Friday is I'll go over some of the homework problems. I'll take questions. We might do a couple of exercises together in class. Um, so this is sort of a chance for us to sort of stop, regroup. I know there's been a lot of new ideas that we've introduced over the past week or so. Um, and so this is our chance to kind of you know, uh, come together and, and do some practice together. I'll take questions and things like that. So that's what we're going to do on Friday. This is sort of a chance for us to sync up again with where I want us to be. On Monday, we'll keep talking about polymorphism, which we talked about today, and at that point, we'll kind of be back on track. Uh, one important note is that next Wednesday, mark your uh, calendars, we will not have class. Uh, I'll be out of town. Um, that's on the calendar. Um, mysteriously, this occurs at exactly the same point as last semester when I had to leave town. It, I, I'm actually out of town, but, um, so this works out nicely, but uh, we will not have class on Wednesday. Um, there'll be no new content posted, um, so it was just, just an off day, right? So that'll be nice. Okay. So last time we started talking about inheritance uh, using the Java keyword, but I want to take a step back and look at kind of what happens once we start to establish these type of parent-child relationships between different Java objects or Java classes, different new types of Java, uh, Java objects. Essentially what this does, and we'll talk a little bit more about this particular data structure later in the class when we talk about data structures and algorithms, but what we're starting to do is we're organizing our Java objects into a data structure that's called a tree. So if you look at this uh, particular diagram, what you'll see is that um, each one, so, so this, the, 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 the um, object, in this case, these are uh, different types of creature, right? So, so uh, the creature at the top doesn't have a parent, but all of these other uh, entities here, cats, dogs, horses, and elephants, have as their parent, that's what this arrow indicates, uh, mammals. So these are all different types of mammals. And then down here, what we've shown, and, and obviously you could subdivide this much, much further. There's many different types of cats. Um, there's several types of elephants, as far as I know. Um, but, you know, it's showing some examples of, and these, these are different breeds um, of dog and of horse, right? So German Shepherd 
uh, has as its parent uh, class in this particular hierarchy dog. It's, an it's, it's a type of dog. Um, dog is a type of mammal. So, this, so what we do in Java is we're essentially um, we're, we're building the same type of hierarchy. You can take all of the different types of objects in Java and organize them into this type of diagram. Now, if you did that, it would be very hard to read because they would be tiny because there's you know, tens if not hundreds of thousands of different types of Java objects in different projects all over the place um, because there's lots of different types of data we want to model in the, in the world, and Java's type system allows us to do this. But essentially what you would see is an instance of this. It's, it's something called a tree um, where uh, this is, so this would extend this, dog would extend mammal, right? Um, elephant extends mammal, uh, Palomino extends horse, extends mammal. So the extends relationship that we put in when we want our class to inherit from another class creates this relationship in this diagram. Um, so the question is sort of why, right? And today we're going to talk about some of the reasons for this, and then we'll also talk some, about some of the consequences of this for how we program with Java objects. And there's some actually some really neat theory um, that we get to talk today about today um, that's related to the, the structure and design of programming languages themselves. So that's kind of a fun thing to be able to mention. Um, so one of the reasons that we do this in Java is that in, in many cases, um, Java's object model maps nicely onto real-world taxonomies. So there are things in the world, like, for example, um, you know, living creatures, that can be organized into this sort of taxonomy. I think, and, and again, this is not the official, you know, uh, zoological uh, version of this particular taxonomy because, you know, a Labrador retriever is actually not a different species. But you can produce a graph like this for all of the living things on Earth, where the top-level divisions are between, you know, plants and animals, and then you have different types of animals, mammals and reptiles, different types of... Are there different types of plants? I don't know. I, this is not my field. But, but you can essentially, you know, one of the things that zoologists have been doing as they try to understand the world is to try to organize living creatures into this type of taxonomy or this type of tree um, where we can see some of the relationships between different types of creatures. Um, you know, being part of the same part of the tree is supposed to mean something, right? There's something that all mammals have in common, right? There's something that all, and, and that's different from, you know, reptiles, right? It's different mammals, you know, animals are different than plants, you know? Um, the other um, reason to do this, so, so this is sort of, um, you know, about the, the kinds of data in the world and how it fits into Java's object system. But this also, um, from the perspective of a programmer, perspective of software engineering, this allows us to reuse and organize code between multiple classes. So rather than having each uh, German Shepherd class have to re-implement all the functionality um, that it shares with other dogs and all the functionality that those dogs share with other mammals, we can simply allow it to extend those classes and then it inherits all the behavior that those classes already provide. So this is the real reason we do this from a programming perspective. It leads to a lot less duplication and a lot more code reuse. Um, frequently when you're trying to do something in Java, particularly if you're working with data, there's probably already a class out there that models that kind of data that's available for you to use. And if you need some new feature, it's also probably possible that you can extend that class and add one or two things to it and it will, it will suit your needs, right? So location, which we looked at, sorry, location, which we looked at a little bit on MP0, there's definitely a class out there already that somebody has provided that you can use that allows you to model location data and probably provides all sorts of really useful methods for you that you don't have to implement yourself. Same thing with strings, right? I mean, strings are just, the string class exists in the world already in Java. You don't have to build it. You can just go use it. Okay. So in Java, as we said before, unlike some other languages, I can only extend one class. And that means that every single object in Java, except for one, has one parent. Now you might be wondering, this is sort of strange. And again, this is not true of all programming languages, but it's true in Java. Um, you know, I didn't use an extends keyword. Um, so if I don't use an extends keyword, what happens? So at the top of Java's object hierarchy, there is a root object. And that object 
is called object. Are you surprised? Um, it's capital O object, though. So this is, a, this is a class in Java. And object is the parent. It's the only of, of everything. It's the ancestor of every single class in Java. Object is the only class in Java that does not have a parent. If you do not explicitly extend another class, then you are implicitly extending object. So this is how Java makes sure that every single class fits into this tree. So if you, so for example, this public class dog, I can declare that, and that's not a problem. But it's equivalent to the declaration on line three. So if you don't extend another class explicitly, then you are implicitly extending object. So any class in Java, every class in Java except object has a parent. If you don't tell Java that you want to have another parent, you end up with object as your parent. So this also means something interesting, which is that, remember last time we talked about inheritance allows us to inherit state or behavior from our parent object. And what this means is that the object class, capital O object in Java, anything that it provides, any state or behavior that it provides is inherited by every single Java object. So any Java object you work with, you can be guaranteed that it provides a couple of methods. And some of them are actually quite useful. There's three in particular that we're going to talk about in this class that are extremely important to understand. And so you can find a list of these online. Um, I think there's actually like eight, maybe in total, eight or ten. Uh, but there's three for our purposes that are, that are particularly interesting. But there's but essentially, so anything that object provides, every single Java class uh, has to either inherit or can extend, which we'll talk about in a minute. So every single Java object will provide, uh, has these methods because they are provided by object. Okay, so there are, like I said, there are three of these that are particularly interesting or important for our purposes. And... You know, we're not going to get to all of these in the next week. In fact, some of these we're not going to see again until later in the semester, but they're all interesting uh, and potentially important. So this one should look familiar to us. We've already seen this. Last time when we introduced inheritance, this was the method that we used to kind of give us a hint that something weird was going on in the world. Two string. So object provides a default two string method. And if you don't provide another implementation of toString, you get the default one from object, and we've seen the output of that already. I'll show you again in a minute. It's not particularly helpful, but this means that every single object in Java can be printed because they all have a toString method. So this is kind of useful. The primary use for this is debugging because now I know that any object I have in Java, I can call toString, and I can get some string representation of that object. If you want to make that more useful, there's a way to do it. We'll talk about it in a minute. But you know that you can print it. And you'll get some sort of string out of two string that you can show in your log messages or as, you know, passed to system.out.println or whatever. Okay, so two string. That's one of, one of the ones. Equals. Aha. So when we talked about strings, we warned you that uh, once you start working with objects, using double, the double equal sign to compare two objects together will not do what you want. You're going to find out, you're going to get uh, plenty of practice with this on MP2. Instead, Java objects all provide a method called equals. That method receives as a parameter another Java object. And the method is supposed to return true if the two objects are the same and false if they are not. What's cool about this is that you can implement equals however you want. There's a default, just like toString, there's a default implementation of equals that you can inherit from the object parent class. That default implementation is not particularly useful. But you can, um, you can provide your own, and you can implement it any way you want. Uh, so, you can just, so this allows you to tell Java how to compare two instances of your class. When you design a new class, you tell Java, okay, here's what it means for two instances of this class to be equal to each other. Okay, so the last one is something called hash code. 
And this is one that we won't get back to for, I don't know, another month and a half, and not towards the end of the semester. What hash code does is it returns an int that's supposed to uniquely represent the contents of an object. And this is something that uh, becomes extremely useful uh, once we start working with um, hash maps later in the class. But for now, you know, you don't need to worry about this too much. These are three of the methods provided by object. And again, object has a default way of implementing this that you can choose to, to replace. All right, so. I've been talking about, you know, replacing methods that are provided by object, but you can do this, when, when you inherit from another class, your class, in many cases, not all, um, but in many cases can choose to modify the way that your parent or your grandparent or, you know, uh, whatever one of your ancestor classes does a particular thing. So, for example, here's a case where I have a dog class. That class does not explicitly extend another class, therefore it inherits from object. Because of that, it has already a two-string method. And we can look at what that default two-string method does. But it's not, the default two-string method is not very useful. Um, instead, what I'm going to do on line six is I'm, this is called overriding, and there's a special, uh, if you do this in Android Studio, there's a special sort of uh, annotation that you use to indicate this. So on line six, what I'm doing is I'm saying, I don't want to use the default implementation of two string. I know that it exists, and that's nice of object to provide that for me, but I want to be able to print instances of this dog differently. Two string has a particular signature. It needs to be marked as public. It returns a string. But what it returns is totally up to you. And if you modify it to print something useful, that means that anybody who's using your class, if they print off an instance of it, will see the result of a call to toString. All right, so let's see. Um, oh, why don't I have a, oh, I'll come back to this in a sec, okay. So let's, let's look at how this, uh, an example of how this works. Um, and, and now I've got like a, a bunch of different, I, I've created a, a fairly um, convoluted object hierarchy here, where I have a class called animal. Animal inherits from what class? Object. Does not explicitly extend anything, therefore extends object implicitly. Class pet extends animal, dog extends pet, old dog extends dog, sweet old dog extends old dog. Again, I'm just creating like a, a linear hierarchy here. Now I'm creating a, an instance of sweet old dog on line 12, and then I'm going to call, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to print it. I'm going to call uh, to string on it, and then we're going to see what we get here. So let's get rid of this method and see what the default looks like. Okay. So now you'll see that there's no class here that's overridden to string. And so what I'm seeing is the output of the default object to string implementation. And all this does is it prints the name of the class, which is the first thing that you see printed, which is sweet old dog, that's correct, an at sign, and then this is, I think, the memory location where this class is stored in memory when the program ran. It's not particularly useful, and you'll see that uh, it tends to change every time I rerun the program. Sometimes. Yeah. So this is not particularly useful. And there's a reason it's not particularly useful that we'll talk about more once we talk a little bit about how, inherent, how inheritance works. But this is essentially kind of what uh, the object knows about the class. It knows the type, and then it knows something about where it's stored in memory. But again, this is not particularly useful information. So how can I make this more useful? So if I, well also, hold on, let's, let, me, let me talk about how the name resolution works here. So once we introduce inheritance into the picture, how Java figures out what method to run becomes more interesting. So in the past, what we've done is we said, you know, does the class provide a public method with a particular name? If the answer is yes, then that's what I use. Once I introduce inheritance into the picture, this story becomes more complicated, because here's what happens. So let's say I call a method. 
on, so in this case, let's, let's look at the example we have here. I'm calling to string on an object of type sweet old dog. So here's what happens. So the first thing Java does is it looks in the class itself. It says, okay, does sweet old dog provide a to string method or not? And let's look. Does it? Is there a to string method with the right signature provided by sweet old dog? Nope. Okay. If not, then I go to the parent of that class. So the next thing, uh, where is the next place I'm going to look here? So I started with sweet old dog. I'm looking for a method called to string. Does sweet old dog provide to string? Okay. Where do I look next? Old dog. That's the parent of sweet old dog. Does old dog provide to string? No. Where do I look next? Dog. Old dogs in inherits from dog. Does dog provide to string? No. Where do I look next? Pet. Does pet provide to string? Where do I look next? Does animal provide to string? Where do I look next? Does object provide to string? Yes. And so that's why, remember I said before, whenever you have a Java object, you can always call methods that are provided by capital O object. And the reason is that if capital O object provides those methods, this search will always succeed. Because even if nothing else in the hierarchy provides to string, I know that when I get to capital O object, I'm going to find the method I'm looking for. Okay, so, so let's see how this works along the way. So let's put a public string to string method in here. And let's return pet. Okay? So now how does the search work? So now I'm starting with an instance of sweet old dog. I say, does sweet old dog provide to string? No. Does old dog provide to string? No. Does dog provide to string? And then, so that's what gets called. So if I run this, now I'm going to see pet. As soon as I find a method that matches, I stop. What happens if I do the following? Let's play around with this a little bit. Um, now what's going to happen? What do you guys think? Make a prediction about what I'm about to see. Yeah. Yep. I go back all the way to object. Why? Because when Java does this, it uses the type signature to match it. So I'm looking, so, so uh, to string does not take any arguments. And so I'm not looking for anything called toString. I'm looking for a function called toString that takes the right arguments. Right? So toString takes no arguments. I've now added an argument to my version of toString that's provided by um, dog. That's all well and good. The dog provides that toString method, but it's not what I'm looking for. So I'll keep going. OK. So now let's do the following. Let's put a new toString method here. So now what's going to be printed? Don't just run it. Reason about it. What's going to happen? So I start with sweet old dog. Does it provide to string? No. I check old dog. Does it provide to string? No. I check dog. Does it provide to string? Yes. So as soon as I find something that matches, I stop. Let me change this slightly down here. Let's make Choo Choo an animal. Now what's going to be printed? When, when I want to take a guess? So now I've got an instance of animal. Oh, sorry. I put it on. That's not what I meant to do. <laughs> OK. Let me fix this example. That is, that is correct, yes. OK. So now it's going to print pet. Why? Because I have an instance of pet here. And I start looking on the pet class, and I go up. I don't go down. I always start looking on the class, and then I search its, descent, its uh, ancestors, not its descendants. It's an important reason why this is, and we'll go talk about it in a few minutes. 
my questions about this before we go on. All right. One other thing I, I need to mention from last time that's important to understand, and, and we'll stop and do a little example of this in a minute. Um, so when, when a class provides a constructor, it's also frequently important that it also construct its parent class. So I can use this special keyword called super to do this. So here's an example where on line seven, I have a class called dog that extends pet I have a constructor for dog that starts on line nine, and the first thing that constructor does is it creates, uh, it sets up the parent class. So what super does is super will call my parent's constructor. So you'll see here that pet provides a constructor that takes a single argument. So whenever I create a new instance of dog, the first thing that's gonna happen is I'm gonna call super and that's gonna run this pet constructor. That's gonna set the type of the pet to dog. And then the dog constructor is gonna go on and do any sort of dog specific initialization that it needs to do. So for example, in this case, my pet class, every pet has a type. Uh, it can be dog, cat, turtle, whatever. Um, but dogs have a breed as well as a type. And so my dog extends pet so it, it inherits the type that pet provides, but it also provides its own instance variable called breed that it sets in its own constructor. If you use super, you don't have to. If you use super, it has to be the first thing that you do inside your constructor. So I can't flip these around. I can't set the breed first and then call super. I have to call super first. That has to be literally the first thing I do. And super, like any other function, accepts parameters and also matches the constructor based on the parameters I provide. So if I tried to call super here without any arguments, it wouldn't work. Because the pet provides one type of constructor, and that constructor takes an argument. So there's no way for me to call an empty constructor. So, so let's, let's try this. So, if you'll, so let's, see, let's walk through what happens here when I run the code. Uh, in the main function, on line 16, I'm creating a new instance of dog that calls, causes this constructor to run because I'm passing a single string argument. That constructor calls super, which, calls the, which causes the uh, pet constructor to run. That pet constructor sets the type of the pet to dog, which is the passed argument to super. And then I set the breed of dog to breed on line 11. So when I'm done, I can print off both. Let's just put some print statements in here just to see what's happening. So this is the pet constructor, and this is the dog constructor. So you'll see the pet constructor is actually the first thing that is printed because I start running my dog constructor, but it calls super, and so that stops and runs the pet constructor. So the first thing I see printed is pet constructor. That runs, it sets the type. If I print off, let's print what the breed is set to here. Um, sorry, the type. So that prints dog. So by the time super finishes, dog is already, uh, the breed, uh, some of the, the type of the pet is already set to dog. Then I set breed here, and then I'm done. So now, now I have my object fully set up. All right, questions about this before we go on and talk a little bit about polymorphism today? Kind of a new, yeah. Great question. So the question is, can super go farther up? Um, that depends on what my parent class does. So in this case, my parent class does not call super. If my parent class calls super, then it, will, it can keep going up, potentially higher and higher. Super will only take you to your parent. Right? As far as I know in Java, there's no way to directly call like a, a, a parent of a parent constructor. Yeah, good question. Other questions about this? You know, I know, from a, I know from a programming perspective, this looks easy, but conceptually, it's not. And I, and I, and I, I you know, understand that, right? You know, and that's one of the reasons that, you know, on, on Friday, we'll get together and we'll, we'll talk through some of this stuff. I know some of you are probably confused. That's okay. 
Um, if you have a question, please, you know, if you can formulate a question, please feel free to ask it. Um, you know, again, this is one of those places where I think sometimes people get a little frustrated because they think, like, this looks so easy, right? There's no, like, double loops. There's no, like, trying to invert arrays, stuff like that. It just from, a, from a, the perspective of, like, a programming problem, it's easy. But conceptually, there's new ideas here that take some time to wrap your mind with. And so, so give yourself time to do that. All right. Last call for questions. Okay. So, let's talk about the big P word, polymorphism. So, in, in Java, polymorph so polymorphism technically, if you, if you look at the, how the word, if you look at the root word, right, morph is to change shape. Poly is multiple. So, polymorphism refers to the ability of a Java in, of a Java object to change or to sort of masquerade as other types of objects, depending on what's required in a particular uh, case. So we're going to talk more about um, interfaces. So, so the definition from Wikipedia says the provision of a single interface to entities of different types. Okay? We'll talk more about interfaces later. But for now, we're going to look at two places in Java where this type of thing occurs. Um, OK. So, so for now, what we've been thinking about is we've been thinking about Java objects as having a single type. But that's not technically true. Again, polymorphism, multiple types in this case. So in Java, I can really consider any instance of a Java object to have at least two different types. Every one but one. The first one is whatever it's declared at. But the second one is object. So in this case, every pet is also an object. And every pet is also a pet. In this case on the bottom, I actually have three ways that I can think about a dog. I can think about a dog as a dog, but a dog is also an instance of a pet. And because pet inherits from object, a dog is also, I can also think of a dog as an object. So this is sort of the, the root of class-based polymorphism in Java, is this inheritance model. Particularly because every object, except capital object, inherits from object. Every object can be thought of as either its own type or object. And then, depending on the inheritance relationship between it and object, there might be several other types but I can also think of that object. Okay, so, so, so far this seems, you know, fairly abstract. But let's look how this actually works in practice. All right, so I've got some code in my main method. And then down here I have this function. This is a static function um, declared on my example class. It's called print anything. And it takes as its argument, a single variable of type object. And so this is where the rubber meets the road. This is what's really important to understand. In my main method, I'm creating two new objects. One is of type dog, and the second is of type pet. So I've got my pet class, I've got dog that extends pet. And now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call print anything. The first time I call print anything, what is the type of the argument that I'm passing to it? This is on line 11. So I call print anything, the type of the argument I'm passing is a? Dog. dog. Yeah, choo-choo is a dog. I declared and initialized choo-choo on line 9. What's weird about this? There's something new here that you haven't seen before. Or maybe it's a mistake. Maybe there's a bug in the slide. There's something odd here. Yeah. No, that's, uh, I mean, I can do whatever I want and print anything. But, that, but, but it seems like there's a bug here. Right? Yeah. No. I can, I can call that method there. Yeah. No, it's all going to be compiled together before it runs. 
Yeah, where, where, where it's located is, is not important. Yeah. Okay, you're on the right track. Why is that a problem? Well, no, but, but like, what's the type that I'm passing to it on line 11? It's a dog. So I've declared this print anything method. And it takes something of type object. But the argument, oops, sorry. The argument that I'm passing to it is a dog. Why is this okay? Is this okay? What do you think? Then, to make matters worse, on line 12, I'm passing a pet. Never seen this before. Up until now, when we've called a function, the arguments, the type of the arguments has matched the type that the function declares, right? So maybe what I really need to do to fix this, maybe this is broken, maybe what I really need to do is I need to define a print anything method that takes a pet, a print anything method that takes a dog, okay? So again, this is the weird thing I want you to notice here. On line 11, I'm passing something to print anything that is of type dog. On line 12, I'm passing something that's of type pet. Print anything is declared to take an object. So it's not clear to us yet that this is going to work. Let's see what happens. Again, may, maybe this is a big setup uh, for the fact that I've broken this example. Okay, well, compiled and ran. Why? Why does this work? Yeah. This is polymorphism at work. Because both dog and pet inherit from object, they can both be considered objects. And so I can pass them to a method that expects an object. Now this has some consequences that we're gonna talk about more today and on Monday in terms of how this variable can then be used. But it works. So I can write a single method down here called print anything that takes things of type object and ca calls println on each one of them, uh, the result of calling two string. Okay, so let's 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 linger here for a minute and let's do some let's try some things here. Okay, so let's change this to take a dog. Okay, so I've got my dog class and all I've done here is I've changed this to take an instance of type dog. Now, can I call two string on an instance of type dog? Why? Why do I know that I can call this two string method on it, an instance of type dog? Why can I be certain of this? Yeah. It inherits the properties of object, exactly. Because dog extends pet, which extends object. And so one of the things I inherited from object, if I didn't provide my own version of it, which I did, which a pet, well, a pet does, right? Sorry, dog does. If I didn't override that, I would still be able to do this. So let me actually get rid of this, uh, my two-string method here. Okay, but this doesn't work. Why not? What went wrong now? Okay, so, so it's, it's complaining about line eight, and it says no applicable method found for parameters pet, why doesn't this work? I was getting all excited about polymorphism for a minute. Yeah. Yes, because every, because every dog is a pet, but not every pet is a dog. And so I've declared print anything to take a dog, but if I pass it a pet, I don't know if it's a dog or not. It could be a cat. It could just be an instance of dog. Exactly. I could also declare this to take an instance of pet. And then let's see what would happen. Now it works. Why? Because one of the things I'm passing to it is a pet, and the other thing inherits from pet, and so it can be thought of as a pet. So again, what's happening here is that the choo-choo object that I'm declaring on line five is morphing into a pet 
when it is used by print anything. It can also morph into an object if needed. So again, if I change this back to object, then choo-choo on line five is morphing into an object, and the pet is also morphing into an object. Polymorphism. My pet class can be used by functions that expect a pet or an object. My dog class can be used by functions that expect a dog or a pet or an object. So again, this is class polymorphism in Java. But here's the thing that's cool. Just because I'm pretending that something is a pet or that I'm pretending that something is an object, it doesn't lose its actual true nature. And so I can, I can see this by doing the following. So I, I, I just had this a minute ago. Let's put a, a to string method here. Oh, that's return string, sorry. Yeah. So now, on line nine, I've created a variable called chuja that's of type dog. When I pass it to print anything, it morphs into an object. But Java still knows that it's a dog. And I can prove that to you because when I call toString, I get the toString method that's defined on dog. It's actually one of the most important things that makes polymorphism work. So just because an object is masquerading as another type, it doesn't lose its true nature. If I call a method, I still get the overridden method that it provides, not the version that the, the class that it morphed, morphs into might have provided. Okay, now I, just, I just did this example. Um, all right. So essentially what we've been looking at, wait, did I skip a slide here? Ah, here we go, yeah. Right, somehow I, I blew past the slide. So the reason this is working is because if I take an instance of a particular type, hold on a sec, Java will automatically cast it for me into any of its parent classes. So what's happening here is when I call print anything on an instance of type dog, that dog is being upcasted to an object while that method runs. Question. Say that again. Mm. Yeah. But, but, I can't, but then I can't call string methods on it. We'll, we'll come back and talk about this in, in, a, in a few minutes. Yeah. There's consequences to this. Um, but Java will automatically do this conversion for you. So if I'm taking a class and I want it to morph into one of its parents, I don't really have to do anything. That'll happen automatically. If I want to take a class, sorry, I'm jumping around today. Um, if I want to take a class and have it morph into one of its children, that cannot be done automatically. So now I actually have to cast things um, explicitly. And the reason is you have to know what you're doing in order to do this. So for example, here, here's what's happening here. I'm taking, um, on line nine, I'm creating a new instance of type dog on the right side and I'm upcasting it to an object. So Choo Choo is now morphed into an object because uh, this I've declared that Choo Choo is an object. So I created Choo Choo as a dog, he's now morphed into an object. I can call print anything using Choo Choo because it's an object, but if I wanna take Choo Choo, which is still a dog, he's, he's masquerading as an object right here. If I wanna downcast Choo Choo into a pet, I can do that, but I have, to ex I have to include this explicit past here. I know people's brains are hurting now, right? Um, and the reason is that not every object is a pet. And so if I'm gonna do this safely, I better know what I'm doing. There are ways to do this wrong, at which point your program will crash. So hopefully I have a little example here. I do, good. Um, so I've taken Choo Choo, which is a dog, which I've created as a dog on the right side and I'm having to masquerade as an object. On line 11, I downcast Choo Choo to a pet, but 
He still knows he's a dog because I keep getting the same string method. And finally, at the bottom, I downcast Juju again to a dog. He still knows he's a dog. What's going to happen if I do this? So now, Juju is actually a pet. I've created Juju as an instance of type pet. I've upcasted that pet to an object on line 9. This is going to fail where? Try to run this. This should crash. And it crashes on... And it crashes saying that I can't convert a pet to a dog. And the place I'm trying to do that is right here. Because what I have is a pet. I can't take an object and, and cast it down, farther down the tree than where it was initially created. Choo Choo here is a pet. I can't suddenly make Choo Choo into a dog. So whatever is on the right side of new is always the type that that object will retain throughout its life. I can have it morph into its ancestors, and then I can then have it morph back into the original type of object, but I can't change it. So for example, here, Choo Choo's a pet. I can't cast Choo Choo to a dog because Choo Choo can't be considered a dog. It's created as a pet. If Choo Choo was a dog, now I can get away with this again. Because Choo Choo is actually a dog the whole time. All right, I'll come back and talk about this on Monday. Um, so I just want to close today by, by connecting this to um, you know, a really important, I, I know your brains are hurting, you guys get lots of practice with this, we'll do this on Friday, we'll talk about this more on Monday. Um, this is cool stuff, but it's conceptually hard to wrap your mind around, and so we will give you lots of practice with this. The cool thing I want to mention here is that this is connected uh, to a principle about programming language design that's, uh, that's frequently referred to as the Liskov substitution principle. And, what, and you can read this long description, and I've, I think I've tried to kind of make this a little bit uh, more clear. But the idea is that if I have, if S is a subtype of T, so in, in, in our terminology, if S descends from T, then any time I see a T, so for example, if string descends from object, any method that takes an object should also be able to take a string. And that method should still work. Why that method works and what the, some of the trade-offs are involved in this, we'll talk about more on Friday and on Monday. Um, so who is Liskov? This is Barbara Liskov. Um, she's an incredibly famous computer scientist, teaches at MIT. She's one of the first women in the United States to earn a doctorate in, in computer science as a field. Um, she's also the winner of an award that we give in computer science. And this is something that I want you guys to understand as budding computer scientists is that this is a field with a long history. One of the ways that we celebrate the history of computer science is that there's a, an award called the, how many people have heard of the Turing Award before? Okay, good. The Turing Award is given out every year um, to you know, somebody who, this is, this is essentially the uh, computer science equivalent of the Nobel Prize. There's no Nobel Prize in computer science. Instead, we have the Turing Award um, named after uh, one of the pioneers, uh, someone who did pioneering work in uh, in computer science in a variety of different fields. How many people have heard of the Turing test? Yeah, go look that up. That's interesting stuff. So I don't, let's see here. I, I can't remember who got this last year. Uh, it starts, starts from 1966. So this award's been given for a while. Ah, right. Last year was Hennessy and Patterson, um, pioneers in computer architecture. I don't know who's going to win it this year. I think it's announced in a couple of months. Uh, but this is always a fun thing to, to pay attention to. Um, the, the type of Tim Berners-Lee, some of you may have heard of the World Wide Web, um, something that he invented. So the, the people that win this award have typically done work that touches your daily lives in a very, very, very direct way. So you guys all use the internet. Um, Hennessy and Patterson, many of you have, I would say all of you have computers with um, hardware on them that were inspired by their work. Okay, so we'll finish up talking about this on Friday. I have a couple of... Very, very quick announcements. MP2 is out. Please get going on it. Um, the, so this week's lab, I think people are enjoying. We'll, we'll reopen it on Thursday once labs end, so you guys can fiddle with it a bit more. I have my normal office hours today. As a reminder, we do not have class a week from today. Mark your calendars. Um, if you have feedback for us, please use the online form. I will see you guys on Friday.